You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello, and thank you for joining us on our sixth annual Holiday Bubble Show. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And I am very pleased to have a friend and professional wine consultant from Worldwide Wines, McLean Oakson. Thank you for joining us, McLean. My pleasure. Good to see you guys. And this is our sixth bubble show. And yes. you're, this is the first time you, you're actually on our bubble show. I'm so excited. And uh, we have some great tastings in store for this evening uh, for 2016 as 2016 comes to a close. We're going to cover the whole spectrum tonight. We're going to do cava, we're going to do prosecco, and we're going to do some true champagnes. Ooh. So it's this will be. This is the, I think this is the first time this we've had a mashup like it is. <laughs> yeah. It absolutely is. And I'm like I said, it's it's a pleasure to be doing our sixth holiday show with you two, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, enjoying what we're doing tonight. So Excellent. I think we should jump right in because absolutely. I'm ready. All right, we're going to start off with a prosecco. This is from the Valdo Biadini section of Italy. Uh, this is a wine growing region near Veneto or in Veneto, and these uh, wines tend to be really fruity. Mm -hmm. I, I love these because they show so much of the fruit, um, not a whole lot of acidity with this. Even though it says brute. Uh, it's a dry style, but it's, uh, you know, the Prosecco grape is, um, it's made with the method Charmat instead of the method Champenoise. So they do the second fermentation in the tank, and that gives you a larger, lighter bubble, a uh, little frothier in the mouth, a little easier to drink. Absolutely. And people shouldn't be, because uh, I know some, sometimes people see an Italian sparkle and they think it's extremely sweet. This is one that should not be very sweet. Right. right. That, I think the people think of the Osti Spumanti mm -hmm. from back in the 70s, which was <laughs> sticky sweet. That was so sugary. Um, that, no, this is a very dry style. Very similar to champagne. Very nice, subtle aroma. A yeah, beautiful aperitif. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, really, sparkling wine seems like a big mystery, but I don't think it really is. I mean, think about it. Ferment anything to create alcohol, ferment beer, get one fermentation, you want bubbles, you just got to do it again. And yep. so the way I remember it is that traditional method or champagne method, they do it in every single bottle. They mm -hmm. restart that fermentation. And when they do Charmat method, it's just in a big tank. And um, as Jim was saying, they prefer, you know, preserve fresh aromas, and it keeps the cost down. So yeah. Prosecco can be your kind of... Everyday bubbles. Well, you know, McLean, so. the thing with Jim and I, and we love our bubbles no matter what time of year, but this time of year, especially the holidays, you know, you have Thanksgiving and you have Christmas, then New Year's. It's just, it's so much more fun to drink sparkling this <laughs> time of year. It's very festive. Yeah. Yes. You're generally dressed up, you're generally mm -hmm. going to Christmas parties or formals, and it's just, there's something about having that glass of sparkling bubble in your glass. And this is when you and I like to splurge a little too. You know, normally <laughs> normally we like to be under $20 <laughs> mm -hmm. for a bottle. Uh, Which I don't think we have anything under 20 bucks tonight. No, we don't. Um, you know, usually if you're drinking a Prosecco, those are under $20. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, when you get into the Valdo Biadines, it's a little higher. Uh, they're in the 20 to $25 range. They can be a little more. And that's, yeah, and that's, that's a standard bear for, for when you're looking at Prosecco, the grape of Galera, you want to look for that. That'll be that, we are saying how difficult this is, Valdo <laughs> yeah. Val 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 Everyone says it differently, and it's a thousand, you know, a thousand syllables. But yeah, you hear five different it. Italian guys pronounce it, you're going to get five different <laughs> I pronunciations. I think it always helps to drink more of it, and then it yeah. just rolls That's up true. the top. <laughs> well, I haven't we'll had a full glass yet. We'll see how my Spanish is, because that one's coming up next. But, <laughs> but this, um, is, this is supposed to be a, like the, the luxury Prosecco. Yeah, absolutely. It's delicious. And Jim, this is available locally, or did you give me this from Boston? Yes. Uh, no, this came from Maximum Beverage in West Hartford. Okay. Very cool. And I noticed this one has a year on it. A lot of times bubbles don't. It depends on the year. Um, if a winemaker wants to, if it's been a really good harvest and they want to put a year on the label, they will. Uh, otherwise, they're, they're constantly blending. Uh, you go back 
three, four, five years, they're blending juice from that far back into mm -hmm. some of the stuff that doesn't have a, a number on it. All right, so thumbs up on that first one. Loved it. Yeah. All right. Loved it. So we're going into a Spanish cava, which is a Finca Alegre. Um, this one is probably going to be unfamiliar with a lot of our viewers and even uh, the two people who are joining me tonight. Uh, this one I received from my wine club about several months back as a three-pack, and I enjoyed two of them, and I saved this one specifically for the show, knowing that neither McLean or Jim had ever had this one before. Um, I like the wine clubs because you're able, you're able to get stuff that you can't get locally, mm -hmm. and you're taking a chance like everything in, in, in the world, but generally I haven't been too disappointed. So um, this particular one is from a relatively small vineyard. Um, it's a little bit higher priced. I think it's in the mid-20s for a cava, which generally I don't buy cavas at that price mm -hmm. point, generally. But when I taste it the first time, I love the subtle dryness. There was still enough flavor. And I think this is the kind of thing, that, especially for Thanksgiving, if you're going to start off with hors d'oeuvres, light cheeses or crackers, pairs perfectly with that before you go into the uh, richness of like a holiday meal. Exactly, so. and and we were talking about the difference in, in method and how that affects you know the the wine and the taste. Um, so you know, cava is champagne method; it's traditional method, um, but usually they use a blend of indigenous grapes and chardonnay, which we talked about before. Exactly. This is more of a chardonnay yeah. based mm -hmm. um, cava. It's clean and. Mm -hmm. All right, let's give it a shot. Yeah, it's got a nice bite on the end mm -hmm. of it. Good minerality. It does have a little bit more of a bite. Yep. Yeah. Than the first one. It's a complete contrast in style. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Which, if you're eating salty snacks, this would be a great pair. They, you know, they always talk about potato chips being the perfect pair with champagne. <laughs> or popcorn. You feel guilty doing it. Yeah. I've mean, no, got this never. really expensive champagne and this really <laughs> cheap junk food. That popcorn has never worked. We've talked about it. We yeah. said, they say, you eat popcorn with bubbles. You eat popcorn with bubbles. Just haven't done it yet, Jim, have we? I haven't done the potato chips. Either. I just we feel kind of weird putting out a bowl of popcorn when we're having all our yeah. wine parties. It just feels kind of well, weird. Well, there, there's still time to, to redo your New Year's resolutions. So yeah, that's my, true. My top resolution is always drink more champagne. Yeah. It all, every <laughs> year. It's always at the top. And then, you know, you know, lose like five or ten pounds like everyone else. But always drink more champagne. Well, you know, I want to say something really quick. I've noticed, and this is probably the case for most bubbles, 11.5, 11.5. Is that the standard, what you're going to see for alcohol? In most um, champagne, yeah, most sparkling, yeah, it tends to be it tends to be moderate. I mean, I don't think I've seen really anything over twelve or twelve and a, 12 and a half. And that that would cover even like a rosé that we're hitting next, which is a sparkling. Exactly. Yeah, it seemed to be slightly lower in alcohol. Yeah, they're not making champagne out of red Zinfandel. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I must say, I even though I've had this before. I still like this one a lot because it does have that little kick. I really good with the chorizo that you brought in and. And that's the thing about bubbles, it's really kind of the ultimate pairing. Mm -hmm. Proper champagne uh, traditionally um, is one of those wines that can conceivably be used from the start to the end of an entire meal. So if you're kind of in a situation where you're doing a fun little tasting menu at a restaurant and you're thinking, yeah. well, I don't want to do the pairings, one salad bottle of champagne will probably get you through. So A lot of people will probably use it as a palate cleanser sometimes mm -hmm. just in between yep. meals because of the effervescence and the cleanness and crispness. And the acid. You know, when we when we taste uh, the Louis Roderay at the end, the real champagne, and that is like a laser beam of acidity. Yeah. It's kind of amazing. So. Well, that's that's why I always recommend it for Thanksgiving mm -hmm. because you want something high in acidity to cut through all the heavy cream sauces and the dark meats that yeah. you get on Thanksgiving. Did you all see that um, that Wall Street Journal article? that It came out last week. I've heard about it. it I was about, about it, yeah. it was about doing, you know, bubbles for your entire Thanksgiving meal. So that was great. We've been doing. We've been recommending that for years. So yeah. most people, and, they, and this goes uh, for my family. I'm sure a lot of other families. You get they get so intimidated about what to serve for wine, mm -hmm. they just throw out everything. You know, heavy cab or you know, and that's like you say, drink what you like. But sometimes those are just too heavy. Yeah. Well, no, cab's the wrong thing to be serving for Thanksgiving. I agree. I agree. But you know, you still see it. Yet you're. Aunt, mm -hmm. Aunt Sally's house or whatever, you know, she's going to put out that cab. That's because that's uh, what they drink all the time. Exactly. So. <laughs> well, turkey is, it is a, kind of a bland meat, unfortunately. So, yeah. Which is why more. we slather it up with gravy. <laughs> yeah. The good stuff. The good stuff. So, I'm actually pushing for tur uh, for chicken as being oh, the meat of choice for I like Thanksgiving. That. I might start a petition on that one because oh, there's like more that. flavor, it's moister, and uh, you know, let the turkeys oh, relax just, for just a Just go with a turducken. Yeah. You get everything. The turducken. Yeah, no, that's true. Who doesn't get a turducken these days? <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen those It's a lost years, art, yeah. I think. <laughs> well, two th I'm, gonna, I'm biased. I'm giving myself a thumbs up for my uh, kava, so. I'm going to give you Very a thumbs nice. up, too. Very nice, yeah. 
All right. Well, we're such an easy crowd. This is going to be thumbs <laughs> yeah. up all the way down. So <laughs> I recall only one time we've had a bad bubbles, and it was me. I brought that one from Russia. In. Oh yeah. Ooh. And I've still never lived <laughs> that one of? down. It was a it was a Russian name. It was uh, they've been making it the same way since turn of the century, and the st it was one of Stalin's favorites. And Evidently, it tasted that way, too. It did. It, it, yeah, it, it tasted, did. Yeah. It, with a hint of Chernobyl, actually. Yeah. Uh, it it was not good. And we tried it twice, I, if yeah. you recall. I liked it for its uniqueness, but not for its taste. No, it, it, it was like harsh. Thumbs, yeah. thumbs up. Harsh like the Russian tundra. Yes. Ooh. Let's just leave it at that. So, but... Um, Two good choices so far. Yeah, so nothing but good stuff tonight. Great. What is next, McLean? So I always go overboard with you while I bring you a ton of wine. Um, so I, I brought one rosé. I thought we should Thank drink you. some pink. Thank you. Appreciate pink. that. Uh, so this is a. So we're still doing champagne method, or traditional method, mm -hmm. and um, we're we're in France now. Um, but it's not from the region of Champagne. Um, this happens to be from Alsace, and it's called Cremant, and that is um, kind of like the, the style and the name of the wine, more or less. And you can have Cremant in a, a number of regions across France, Burgundy, the Loire, and Alsace. So this is kind of a beautiful salmon -y color. Beautiful salmon And the Cremant name is not protected like Champagne. So you can, exactly. you can get a Cremant it's from another part of the world. Um, yeah, it's not protected that way, but you rarely see that outside of, um, of outside of France because no one kind of knows what it is. It's, it's a little bit of a hidden secret there. You want to bomb something? And you said know. Alsace. It's not, is it Alsace or Alsace? Alsace. And, and you would say Alsatian. 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 Yeah, Alsatian. Yeah, so Alsatian. Because we did an Alsatian show a few yes. shows back mm -hmm. yeah. um, when you went to France. Yeah. And you went actually to that region, correct? No, we uh, we were in Paris, and oh, that's Al right. Alsace was six mile, six hours away by car. That's it was, right. It was a little too far for us to travel out. You can get a train. I've I've been there, um, which is it's beautiful. It's very it's German esque because you know the region is kind of flipped. Mm -hmm. You get German flip sides between France and Germany yep. over the years, so it feels like kind of like little yeah, Germany there. That's, that's what you said. We didn't actually do a sparkling on the. Uh, no, but show. I did go to Epernay and Reims, oh. which is in the Champagne District. So Fabulous. Right. So that'll work right into this show. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, this is 100% Pinot Noir. Um, which is which is fabulous. So the three main grapes of Champagne are, are two are very familiar grapes that we see from real Champagne, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. and then a third little known grape called Pinot Meunier, which is more of a workhorse grape, gets less press. But with Cremant, um, they can use a variety of grapes depending on the region. This 100% Pinot Noir and Lucien Albrecht, uh, the name it, it's now more of a firm, but um, the original Lucien Albrecht helped uh, Cremant Alsace become its own. AOC. So that's kind of a big deal. And uh, this retails for about $17.99, give or take. Oh, um, so we did have one under 20 bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true. Now, so. What I love about this, because um, I like rosé color, but this color is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It looks so great in a glass. And uh, you know, McLean, we, me and Jim were talking before the show. It seems like the old style traditional champagne glasses are coming back in style again. I've been seeing mm -hmm. them more and more often. Um, do you have an opinion on that? Well, I, I find kind of in the wine community, it's, it's a little bit split. So that the traditional uh, wine uh, champagne stems are definitely more nostalgic. I see a lot of Psalms um, doing something even larger than this, using mm -hmm. a basic white wine glass. And that's to yeah. get more aromas, um, uh, to treat champagne and bubbles as... As a true wine. Just as a wine. wine, exactly. Well, and so That's I, what they're balancing, though, is the aroma versus losing the bubbles. Exactly. So if you want to preserve the bubbles, you need something like this. Now I'm a fast drinker, so I can, okay. ha I can handle this. <laughs> but if you're kind of slow in the sipper, you, know, you might want to consider the flute, because it will kind of conserve bottle, bubbles. Um, but, the, but the coupes are really are really fun. I have some uh, some from my from my grandmother uh, that I love using, but they're totally impractical. They are. Uh, for bubbles, because the bubbles just go, yeah. you know, so it's... Um, but I think the white wine glasses, if you're in a pinch, and um, that's kind of like the chic psalm way, and this is super nostalgic and traditional, and the coupes are just kind of fun. Have a little platter, so... Like you said, it's really more about the effervescence. I like the effervescence, mm -hmm. effervescence of the bubbles, which is why it's one of my favorites. Yeah. And I know the wider the opening, the quicker you're going to lose that effervescence of That's the true. wine. Yeah, but a good bubble, champagne, or whatever, a sparkling, the flavor still should be there, even without the, uh, the effervescence. So. Agreed. And, you know, the bubbles that we're tasting now, you can actually go and drink uh, kind of in the area. So the Lucien Albrecht Rosé, a firebox restaurant in Hartford, is pouring that by the glass, uh, which is super fabulous. Wow, that's so, great. Yeah. And if you ever get down to Chester River Tavern, this has been on, the, um, on their by the glass list since they've opened. Mm. 
So um, kind of fun to go and, and actually get it with great food as well if you're kind of out and about celebrating. So. Well, we're always out celebrating something. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes it's just celebrating Tuesday. Sometimes it's celebrating yeah. Thursday. It really makes no difference. So. And, and doing wine pairings all the time, too. So Yes. But uh, that's delicious. I love, love, love this one the best so far because it has that subtle fruitiness of a rosé. It's not too... It is dry. It's, it's a, a bird style, but yeah. it's got strawberry fruit notes, and it's you know. But I, I can taste all sauce in this. It's got you know, it's got a, just a touch of sweetness to it, mm -hmm. which reminds me of some of the you know the sweet you get um, the Riesling and the Gewürztraminer from that mm -hmm. region as well, and some of the and Pinot Gris. And they walk a really fine balance, which is kind of what this wine's all about. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. Two thumbs up on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Two thumbs up on that. And just one. drinking pink is just. Like, that's always fun. It's like 30% more festive, I yes. think. Well, so. well, you know, I, I, did we tell our audience what the name of the show was? I, I don't know if we did or not. It's um, To Pop or Not To Pop. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far, everything is definitely you pop. pop. Yes. You pop, <laughs> pop, pop. And pop it now and pop it now. And, pop it it now. and <laughs> just, I really, really like that one. Probably. Well, yeah, and just to stress popping it now, um, if you're drinking Prosecco, that's not a, a wine you want to store for a long period of time. So you definitely want to pop it very soon after buying it. Don't keep your bubbles uh, too cold for too long if you are keeping it around for a couple of months. Um, and that's because uh, the cork will, will shrink and the wine will oxidize and you'll lose some fizz. Mm. So uh, if you have several bottles uh, in a fridge, trade them out every now and again or keep them in a cool closet or if you have a basement, then that's a great place to Do you have to a go. recommended temperature for storing wine? For storing champagne? For store, you know, I kind of just roll with that basic, you know, between 55, 57 degrees on that. Okay. Yeah. That's that's usually where I keep mine too. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, there's some debates about whether it's better to store on its side or standing up. Yeah, that's, for, there's a lot of debate on that. Yeah, right. so I, I'm a little pressed for room sometimes, so they're currently in there. But bubbles don't last long. Yeah, in my house, <laughs> 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 it's like it's there, and I, I want to drink it now. So well, I just read a couple of weeks ago that 97% you know, of the wine consumed in the United States is consumed 48 hours after purchase. No so doubt, it's, uh, people aren't storing wine here in the U.S. like they are over in Europe. That's true. You know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, I've always wondered, like, how long could you keep a bottle, a good bottle, not like a $6 bottle of Rocher or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but how long could you keep a bottle at the proper temperature and still expect quality from it? Um, it depends on the wine. Absolutely. It does. Absolutely. I mean, some wines, I've, I've had some very old wines. Um, some um, are meant to age. Yeah, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about sparkling. Here. Oh, sparkling. Yeah. Um, mm. I, traditionally, vintage champagne. I mean, no point in storing prosecco. That's not what it's for. Um, and price. A really rough way to say it. I'm always hesitant to put the blanket, you know, like it's saying. But price can kind of dictate the quality mm -hmm. of the wine and how long it can age. So you are aging bubbles, um, vintage into champagne or what they call a tete de cuvee, so kind of a top bottling from a top house. From so, the 80s, because I've seen like Dom Perignon, 80s, uh, late Dom, 80s. Um, uh, Paul Berger has a, uh, their tete de cuvee is uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, Louis, Louis Ritteré does Cristal, um, it's probably one of the more, the more famous. And there are, there are, you know, Veuve Clicquot does Le Grand Dame and on and on and on. So most top houses, as they call uh, champagne producers, um, have a have a tete de cuvee for the, the big guys. So. All right. Well, let's keep that in mind, Jim. When we really want to splurge. Oof, call me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is our... For oh, by the way, once again, I, thumbs up. I think we all agree on that thumbs one. Up. Yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah, I look at yeah, the absolutely. price, too. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, next. So this is... I wanted to bring you two from the same producer. So uh, there's a, a, a champagne house called Le Rotere. They produce Cristal and other finely tuned champagnes. And they also have had a, a long time project in California in Anderson Valley. Uh, so a very cool climate, uh, very northern part of California. And predominantly Pinot Noir and a little bit of Chardonnay. Again, traditional champagne grapes. And the same method. Uh, but a great value and a slightly different style. And this has been a trend with some of the top champagne houses in France. Exactly. They've been buying property in California and producing similar wines, not the same wines, and they obviously can't call them champagne because they're made in California. I, uh, they, exactly. I, mean, I, I don't know if, does Corbel still put champagne on the, on champagne on the I don't bottom? Think they I do. Do they? I, they finally took that I off? I, I feel like they, every time I yeah. go in there, I'm like, that's not champagne. Just confusing people. Um, but, but Corbel, you know, for, it does some high-end 
wines. I think it was actually poured at the at the White House. It's considered you know kind of American champagne. But this is this is right on track with this. So um, Eric Asimov from the New York Times, their wine critic, calls Ritter Estate kind of the benchmark for high quality domestic domestic traditional method champagne. Um, so I want to, to bring this in, and also because I'm super in love with the real stuff. So I wanted to kind of bring them and have that, have that contrast. You get the yeastiness of this one mm -hmm. pretty strongly compared mm -hmm. to the first three right off the bat. And they're, they're, they really do everything right. Um, they use indigenous yeast. It's all estate fruit. So they own every single grape, every single plant. Everything that goes in this is owned. And that's, and that's not what you see in California these days because it's kind of expensive to do, mm -hmm. even in Anderson Valley. Um, you will see some, a little bit of still Pinot Noir um, and, and Chardonnay up in that region, but a lot of bubbles. Now, this is so well balanced. It's, it's consistent, start yeah. to finish. And I think that's what we found out from numerous shows, both here and our own personal tastings, that when you get up to quality level sparkling champagne, the smoothness and the balance is really quite pronounced. Yes. And you, you're definitely tasting um, some quality that, I'm not, I don't want to say is lacking from some other ones, but there's just... There's a lot of detail in this one. The detail, I think mm -hmm. that's a good way to put it. Definitely a little bit more detail. Yes, and uh, it, it's a great time of year to buy bubbles um, because you know I work for a distributor. And so I would say about 75% of the bubbles in my book are are at a better price, so retailers can sell at a better price. So right now, this retails around, you know, at around 22, anywhere from 22 to 25, depending. But still a very reasonable price. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely reasonable. And it, I think for the quality of everything we drank tonight, the prices uh, are kind of misleading because mm -hmm. to me, they, they taste more expensive than that. So. Um, and, um, and just a quick note, so predominantly Pinot Noir, but obviously this is not a rosé. Um, they do make a rosé, but they add in still reserve Pinot Noir wine for color. So basically, there is no skin contact when you're kind of dealing with that. Just so people are not super familiar with, with how to make it. So, yeah. Well, i got to say, as, as we're getting to the end of 2016, and we've done a lot of great shows in 2016, um, I always look forward to this show the most because, you know, it always... It has all sparkling. <laughs> yep. And as much as I love all kinds of wine, I know Jim loves all kinds of wine. I love my sparkling champagnes, cavas, whatever you want to call them. It's just I get so excited this time of year. I'm all giddy. We get to dress so, up. We get, get to, to dress up. Great wine. <laughs> and uh, I'm very giddy right now. So it's uh, Effervescence. It's it really a is thing. very, very nice. Very, very nice. It just, yeah, it instantly changes your mood. You, you can be in a bad mood and have a little champagne and suddenly you're feeling better about life. I've been drinking a lot of champagne this year. <laughs> a lot of champagne this year. <laughs> now, for, for Worldwide Wines, I know you, you're all over the place. And uh, is there anything big coming in 2017 for you? Are there any uh, big expansions or anything new coming in to Worldwide Wines? I mean, we're just seeing um, champagne in general, bubbles. Uh, we're having a really good year for bubbles. Um, rosé has been, rosé sales have been through the roof. Yeah. We're, cons we're continuing to see that. You guys might have to do two rosé shows next year, and I demand a just spot to, on the rosé show. Just to show. squeeze them all in? Just to squeeze them all in. Because it took it's, five, uh, almost six years, Jim. <laughs> six years, but we finally realized that. Spearheaded. Oh, we spearheaded yes, that we whole Yes, we did. Crazy. We were pushing rosé. Ahead of your time. Summer. <laughs> but, um, well, I heard champagne sales are up this year, too, that uh, you, the U.S. is importing 7% more champagne than they did last year. Right, so people that, are coming back to agreed. the traditional. And you see, and a little bit of that's the economy kind of recovering. People have a little more money to kind of play around with. Wasn't and, there um, a problem, though, uh, in Europe with wine production this year? A big one. Um, champagne suffered a little bit. Burgundy's had a really tough couple of they years. They had a lot of hail. Just a wiped ton out of hail. Of the, um, the Loire's had some issues. So, and even actually, um, I believe Argentina has. Had, mm. I think they were down about twenty five percent for this year's harvest. And that's been, you know, the go to for, you know, you can't afford Burgundy or, or, or because of the uh, what's left to purchase is almost nothing. Mm -hmm. So people go to the New World for for value and. That we maybe short change there too, so we'll, well have I mean, to see have you how it plays the, out. I, I haven't seen the prices going up substantially in most places. Not yet. Uh, oh, not uh, yet. Oh, well, the one thing I've seen a lot of pricing go up in is has been um, California has been Napa, Napa proper, mm -hmm. and we have a we have a killer portfolio of uh, big and, and small names, really important producers, but everyone is kind of 
shift it up. So it's really challenging. Someone says, I want to pour great Cabernet by the glass, and I want it to be Napa. And I say, do you want to be $20 a glass? Because then we, yeah. the world's your oyster. But otherwise, it's, it's tricky. There's not a lot of land left. So yeah, it's a struggle. Now, as the show has gone on, and just before it started, these have been sitting for a while. Um, you yourself professionally, would you leave bubbles out without being chilled during a party, or would you keep them in a chiller? I, I would put it in a chiller. Yeah, with a little stopper. Sometimes you have a little stopper that you can kind of stick in and crank on, and that's just to you know keep the effervescence mm -hmm. in. Yep. And um, but I think a chiller. I mean, I, I don't mind bubbles kind of being this kind of mid. It's not room temperature, more cellar temp. It doesn't have to be ice cold, but. Yeah, but you make a good point about putting the stopper in because I do wine tastings, mm -hmm. uh, especially with bubbles, and after three hours, the bubbles are gone. Yeah. And you're, you're still trying to get someone to experience what it's like when you first pop it, and it's not the same experience. Exactly. Is there any kind of professional stopper that's out there that sits in the top and it keeps the bubbles in, and then you could pour it and it seals it right back there up? There are several different types. I mean, the, the, the one that's worked well for me is actually a cheap topper from a Prosecco brand. So it's just, it depends on kind of what you come across. Sometimes they have a cage on both sides that kind of clamp on, you push mm -hmm. down and clamp on. And sometimes it's, you know, stopper here and then you clamp on that way. And just be careful, you're just taking them off. Always have your hands on top because I've knocked myself in the chin before, kind of not because well, of yeah, pressure. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Really what this comes down to is just don't freaking let the wine sit in there too long. Just <laughs> exactly. Drink it. That's, just drink it. It. That's really That's what it comes down to. I'm sorry, I don't think we'll get have a chance to open up the last one, but do you want to talk about that last one that's on the table? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, uh, we just drank Ritter Estate. This is Lou Ritter Ray's so Champagne Proper. Um, what's interesting about the history of Champagne is that it used to kind of be a, a dumping ground. Champagne was made um, was made in the cellar and not mm -hmm. in the vineyard. And so they actually used to truck out trash from Paris to Champagne and lay it on top of the vineyards. And this was you know, probably 100 years ago. So what we're seeing now are important producers and small producers alike taking care of the vineyards. So Lee Roderay is going to be certified biodynamic uh, by 20, uh, 2020. Wow. So uh, we're talking Cristal mm -hmm. being biodynamic. Yeah. And that is, um, that's really special because a lot of time the vineyards to be certified in that way. And uh, there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of reserve wine in there for dosage. So um, a little bit of vintage and uh, it's very special. So, yeah. Well, in our remaining minute or two, I think we should finish off with the, the nice red one for the holidays. Yes, a toast. So, little toast for 2016. Another great year, Jim, on the air. That's Congratulations, really nice. gentlemen. Episode. Well into our sixth year now. <laughs> Old pros. And, and I just want to remind you at home, don't forget you can watch previous episodes of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine on whctv.org or on youtube.com. And as always, if you have a question or comment for Bob and I to answer here on the show, please friend us on Facebook. You'll find us at Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. And remember, we spell Lotta, L-O-T-T-A. <laughs> so, McLean, thanks again for joining us for our for third time. Always my pleasure. Jim, thanks again for coming down from Boston. I know you uh, have quite a life up there. but I, I thanks never for leaving the, the show. <laughs> the big city to come down to the little city. I do appreciate that. And uh, McLean, once again, thanks for your selection and Jim, your selection too tonight. And thanks to everybody who's been watching for well into our sixth year now. It's been a great run, and uh, we're going to continue. Absolutely. So uh, cheers. Have a Salute. happy cheers. holiday, everybody. Salute. A yes. safe holiday. And once again, please uh, try some of these bubbles. You will not be disappointed, mm -hmm. whether it's things you've seen on this show, the things you've seen on the show's past, I think... Uh, yeah, okay. don't be afraid to go back and watch old episodes of our champagne specials looking for some real gems. Yeah, because there have been, except the Russian one. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> go right past that one. So thanks for watching. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbro. And uh, keep all of us in your cellar for 2017. That's right. <laughs>